God bless you. To go from here and share this love you gave to me.
of new faces on top of faces that I've been building relationships with. So great to see everybody here. Um, we have nothing really that I'm going to announce today because I forgot to look at that. Um, so food after church. That's the big one. Um, but please make sure to join us downstairs for our fellowship dinner. Um, and Justin is going to open us up with a small piece of scripture. Yeah. We'll start. We'll start? Yeah. Okay. Then, um, please join us. Not in the Just join us in a heart of worship. With my luck. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Praise the Lord, give glory and praise and thanksgiving to the Lord.
20, 1 through 2. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Please join us in our congregational hymn, Blessed Assurance. It's 369 in your hymn.
on page 749 in your handout. Keep me, keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from the lips free of deceit. From you, let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. Concerning what others do, I have avoided the ways of the violent by following your word. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show me your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from the adver adversaries at their right hand. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with beholding your presence. specifically, not only for this service, but for the ministry of this church. I think you can feel the power of that prayer already here this morning. And as Pastor John uh, told me when I handed him the mic over there, the presence of the Holy Ghost is just so heavy this morning. We have so much to be thankful for this morning, don't we not? Amen. Are we not a blessed, blessed people by God? He has provided for us a way to keep our families. You know, I'm going to say this probably when we go down to eat. This is something that's been on my heart. Yesterday at the men's event, you know, I looked at that table. We had two tables full of food over there. And the only thing that I could think of was those pictures of those starving kids I see in Africa. And here we are, so blessed. Sherry made Spam, sam spam sandwiches the other day, which I like Spam. Man. <laughs> and I told her what a good cook she was. And she said, it was just Spam. I said, do you remember those kids on that, on that TV screen we saw the other night? They would have loved to have had a spam sandwich, huh? And so we are a blessed congregation this morning. We are a blessed people. And that source of that blessing has to be God. And I hope you understand that. So there's many things we have praise for today. I just, you know, I, 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 I know we could go through a whole time here, but I just want to thank everybody that, that has helped to make this happen here this morning. I, I just want to, especially these guys here, uh, were you not blessed here this morning by the, by the music here this morning? God has intervened in many lives this week. I have personally seen the power of prayer in real life this week. And so, these flowers, they're in memory of Jenny Wilson. Um, thank you so much for everybody that did so much. Thank you so much. 
for everyone that's been blessed this week and has a praise week. Just raise your hand. Amen. I told the men's group last night, in my lifetime, I have never seen a time like this. <coughs> Along with all the blessings that we have, I believe there is a resident evil that has descended upon <coughs> us. I have never seen so many people in crisis in my life, whether it's a spiritual crisis, mental crisis, physical crisis, whatever the case may be, and it's just like it's descending all at once. Our only hope is in the Lord. I mean, that's it. I'm, I'm thankful for the doctors. I thank you for the people that have stuff. I thank you for those professionals and everything else. But God is our hope. And there is no other hope. And so today, on this, this, this amazing day that, that we celebrate the goodness of God that in his divine mercy, he gave us the ability to expand ministry. The possibilities over on that property are endless. And he has so blessed us that financially, in a very short amount of time, we have, he has done what only God can do. And today, we're going to celebrate the paying off of the mortgage, which is totally biblical, and where we're going to go from next. If you need a blessing from God this morning, will you raise your hand? I am going to pray for the altar because that's where I pray best. If you would love uh, after the guys sing this morning to come and join me around this altar, I would just love to have you in one accord this morning with one prayer in unison. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
Jesus this morning. There is no name higher. There is no name greater. There is no name that is above the name of Jesus Christ. And we celebrate what he has done for us, what he is doing for us, and what he will do in the future. I celebrate today the fact that you have moved in people's hearts. You have moved in people's bodies. You have cleared up diseases. You have held on where there were. There are folks here today, Father, that have burdens of heart. There are folks that are desperately in need of prayer this morning, of a healing touch of Jesus Christ. Father, we lift them up to you today. We lift up this service today. We lift up everything that's going to happen here today to bring you glory. We don't, we don't claim that glory for any of ourselves, but we give that glory to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. We pray that you would move upon this church, that you would send a spirit of revival upon her, that she would be a lighthouse in this community for folks to be able to see Jesus Christ for who he is, what he's done, and what he's doing, and how he can change lives. Father, we just thank you today that you're a God of, God of mercy, you're a God of grace, you're a God of forgiveness. And so, Father, as as we begin to prepare our hearts for the word today to begin now we're already in worship but we want to hear the worship of the word today father let that prayer be given by that prayer that you taught your disciples our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory for other. And all God's people said, Amen. This old dog's learning new tricks. <laughs> we have found that over the course of the last year, our giving in the first service has been better 
since we did that than it was when we passed a plate around. But something else that I wasn't doing in the first service, and I had a younger pastor uh, kind of discipline me. <laughs> and what we're going to do, I'm going to encourage you guys that before you leave here, you put your offering in one of those places. But what we're going to do now, you all are going to stand up and in an act of worship, <clears throat> lift our hands and sing the dog solitude for what it was. I'm sure you know that. <laughs> <laughs> for what it was meant to be, and that is a time of worship. <clears throat>
great job. So I want you to have lots of funness in your life. And so we have, you got your little kazooey things, and I got you some whistles, some flutes, maybe you want to play them with Justin and I when we sing later, cover up our noise. Um, but it's just a wonderful time to celebrate. It's a wonderful time to celebrate. And you don't have to be in harmony. That's what I like about being a couple of boys. You know, not everybody has to sing in harmony. I'm not the harmony. This man's the melody, I'm the noise. So, you know, but we have lots of fun doing it. And we worship God. So, let's make a noise one more time. Ready? And then we are going to pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for this time to celebrate and this ability to make joyful noise to you and to honor you and remember the blessings that you give us in every day, in every way. Amen. All right, and these ones back, we borrowed these from Stella. But thank you so much. Go ahead, Ian, one more time, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to give this young man something like that. <laughs> Damn, I drew a On this very special Sunday, I am privileged uh, to listen to the Word of God uh, from my elder. Pastor John, would you come up and share with us the Word? Just to sign. Now I want to say that when Tom asked me to preach on the celebration Sunday, and I went home that day from church, and God took me to a passage. And ever since he took me to this particular passage, I have felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon not only the scripture, but upon me. And for those who've never experienced the fullness of the Holy Spirit moving within them or giving them a feeling, that's okay. Because sometimes you just know and that knowledge comes from knowing the Word of God and living the Word of God. But I'm a very feeling person. I come from a very huggy, feeling family when I was growing up. And so that was something that was very special to me, to feel something. And I have felt the anointing and, and the presence of the Holy Ghost upon me ever since the Holy Spirit led me to this scripture. And Tom, I'm going to tell you, and I told this to Crystal Wednesday night, I can't go up there with shoes on. I'm going to have to take my shoes off because I believe we are standing on holy ground. Amen. I truly believe that with all my heart, that God has brought us to a point in the ministry and life of this church where we are on holy ground and we better have ears to hear and we better have hearts that are open to what God is going to say to us, not just through me, but through the remainder of the ministry that we share together because he wants to do great and mighty things. It's not about Tom. It's not about me. It's about worshiping. And, and the holiness of God and what he wants to do in each and every one of us in this place. You're not here by chance today or because we're having a party. Every single person in this place today is here by divine appointment. Amen. 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 
God wants you to be here. God has something special for you today. God wants to move in you and through you today. And if you're open and receptive to what he's going to share with you, he's going to transform your life. And he's going to transform the ministry that we share together. I believe that with all my heart as I have been preparing for several weeks for this point in time. And so, Tom, I'm not doing this because of crystal, liking to be in bare feet. <laughs> my wife asked me this morning before we left the house, do you have clean socks on? <laughs> I assured her that I have clean socks on. In fact, there was no holes in them. I checked them out. <laughs> but I feel like Moses today. When he went up on top of the mountain of God, and he had to remove his sandals because he was on holy ground. Amen. I hope every one of you don't think I'm crazy, but that you can experience that holiness that, I, that just is running through me right now in a very powerful way. And, and I want that for you. I want you to know that God is speaking to you today and wants to do something special in your life. So, God bless you. If you'll take your Bibles out. I want you to turn to the first chapter of John. You know, I believe that every single word in God's Bible, not man's Bible, God's Bible, from the first verse in Genesis chapter 1 to the last verse in Revelation is divinely inspired, is an errant, without any error, and was breathed into for us, breathed from God through man for us from the heavens. It was written in the heavens before it was written by man through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But I'm firmly becoming more and more convinced that John chapter 1 is, if it's not the most important, it's one of the most important chapters in the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you about it shortly, but let's read it first. John chapter 1, verse 1, if you'd stand with me to give reverence to it. And just don't read words. Look at the message that God is giving to us through John, through these first 18 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him today, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is only the begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. May God have his blessing upon the reading and our hearing of his holy and precious word. Please be seated. When I was in seminary, and that was both a blessing and a liability, <laughs> I always told people early on in my ministry that when I went to seminary, I learned not what to be because there was a lot of stuff being thrown about that did not line up with what's contained in here. But I do remember one thing that one of my preaching teachers shared with me. It's a very simple phrase, but it's very true. He said, John, he said, when you preach, keep it simple, stupid. Amen. Keep it simple. Let me ask you a question this morning. Have you ever sent a message and wondered if it got through? Maybe you emailed a colleague and didn't hear back from them. Maybe talking to your children is like talking to a brick wall. I want us to understand something that's very important. Real communication doesn't happen when a message is sent. Real communication happens when a message is sent and then the message is received in a timely and accurate manner. And I want to add to that, that really effective communication occurs when someone sends a message Someone else receives that message in a timely and accurate manner, and then they act upon the message. When a message results in action, that's effective communication. I'm going to skip a lot of this. I have a lot in here. When you really care about getting your message across, you have to be creative. Yes. How disappointing it is to send out an important message that never gets through. Now, I'll give you an interesting story that's true. Back on Valentine's Day, February 14, 2019, hundreds of thousands of text messages were sent out all over the United States. And then they disappeared. Notice that many of these lost messages were Valentine's. They were never received until nine months later when those original text messages somehow began popping up in recipients' phones. Imagine the confusion of the recipients. Some of the messages were from people who had since passed away, or from lovers who had ended relationships. And this massive example of miscommunication was finally traced to a company called Cineverse that provides networking services for many major cell phone carriers in the United States. 
A single server at this company went offline on Valentine, Valentine's Day, trapping hundreds of thousands of unsent text messages in its system. And the issue wasn't fixed until November of that year. And suddenly all those unsent messages flooded into people's cell phones, creating all kinds of confusion and possibly some awkward conversations. Can you imagine sending out a text saying, I love you, babe. Oh, I'm so glad I married you. Oh, I can't wait to celebrate Valentine's Day with you. And not hearing back from the person that you love, that you sent the message to. How many arguments or hurt feelings were caused by those missed messages that perhaps were delivered at a time that might have proved awkward? And I thought of this illustration and this true story when I read from the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Because these first few verses in John are meant to be a message of love, even if they start out somewhat confusing for us. For it says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. Now notice that in writing the Word, John is talking about Jesus himself. Pastor John Piper puts it this way, and I quote him, Jesus himself, in his coming and working, and teaching and dying and rising again was the final and decisive message of God. Now think on that. It was the final and decisive message of God, Jesus himself. God sent us a message. But as I noted earlier, real communication only happens when someone receives the message in a timely and accurate manner. Amen. And really, effective communication only happens when the recipient of that message receives it as ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive it and then acts upon what that message is. So my second question to all of you this morning is, so what about you? What about you? Do you want to head into the rest of today with a message from God? If you do, these verses that follow from John have some exciting things to tell us that we need not only to hear, but to take within our hearts and live out. The first thing John tells us is that when we look at Jesus, we see God's plan for our lives. When we look at Jesus, we see God's plan for our lives. From the beginning of time, God planned for us to be his children. Because before the foundation of the world, God ordained that Jesus Christ would be the Lamb of God who would come to die on the cross to take away your and my sins. And so from the beginning of time, God planned for us to be his children. And we see that in verse 12. It says, yet to all who did receive him and to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So that tells me that everyone who receives Jesus as Lord and Savior gets adopted into God's family and into his life. That boggles my mind. Simon Hall, a chef in Knoxville, Tennessee, says his family and friends worried about him when he decided to adopt two sons in 2017. 
He went on to say, and I quote, nobody can truly understand why I did what I've done, but I did it on faith, I did it on intuition. Paul is a single man with a successful catering company in Tennessee, and he was taking on a big responsibility when he decided and elected to adopt the two brothers from the county foster care system. And that responsibility grew even bigger when he discovered that his two new sons had four other siblings separated into various other foster homes in East Tennessee. Hall's budget and schedule were already pretty tight, but his heart was full of love and compassion for these children. He went on to say they were meant to be a family, and if he was willing to make the sacrifice, they could be reunited. And so he petitioned the court to adopt all six children into his family. And as he says, and I quote, in the end I knew that this was what I was supposed to be doing and I knew that they were supposed to be together. And this is the clincher for me. He said, I just knew that they would heal in my home. Did you hear those words? I just knew that they would heal in my home. I can't help but believe that God says the same thing about the ministry here at Mount Olive when new people come and find their way into God's house and that that property that we have just paid off will be a part of it, including those new people so that they can have healing for their bodies, minds, and souls. You see, that was God's plan for us from the beginning of creation, to adopt us into his family where we could find healing in his home, in his heart, and ours. I don't know about you, but through the years, you know, I got saved on August 13th, 1963. Up at Wesley Woods, church camp. That's when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Now, I wish that I could say that from August 13th, 1963 to today, that my life has been perfect. That I have never sinned since. That I have never walked and strayed. And if you believe that, I'll sell you a property in Florida. <laughs> God's not finished with me. And, and there are times through the years that I have had to go back to him over and over and over again to find healing for me. He's still working on me. He hasn't perfected me. But I know that because of his love for me, and the gift of Jesus Christ, I can always come home. Amen. Amen. And he'll never cast me out. Why would an eternal God create beings made in his image, breathe his own life into them, and then leave them to die? The answer is he didn't. God made us for eternal life. Before the creation of the world, God also worked to create us for abundant life. And the first thing we see in this first chapter of the Gospel of John is that when we look at Jesus, we see God's plan for us. And every single person in this church Today, God has a plan for you. Amen. A plan for you. Amen. He has a plan for Mount Olive. Amen. And together we can make a difference in people's lives Amen. Amen. as we share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's planned to bring us home. Into his home and to heal our heart. 
The second thing that John tells us in this gospel is that when we look at Jesus, we see God's love for us. Not a cheap love, a pure love. John 1.14 reads, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Not just, I have come to visit you, but I have come to live with you. Instead of waiting for you to come to me, I'm coming to meet you right where you are. I think most of us start off each day searching for something. Maybe we're searching for closure from yesterday. Maybe we're searching for understanding or forgiveness. Some of us are searching for a second chance to get things right. And there may be some of you sitting here this morning that don't even know if you believe in God or if God believes in you. You want to believe that God's real, but you don't think you're good enough for him to notice you. And in your mind, all these smiley, sincere, Bible-quoting people around you, God came for them. But you've got a lot of work to do on yourself before you can even think of asking for his attention. Well, friends, I want to tell you, you got it all wrong. If that's what you think. This Bible passage makes it very clear and simple. God came to live in your neighborhood. He came to live in your home. He came to live in your heart. God came looking for you. When I think about who I am, when I look in the mirror, there are days when I don't like what I see. And I think uh, of the Apostle Paul in Romans 7 where he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Because I don't live up not only to his expectations, but I don't live up to my own. The Bible makes it clear God came to live within you. Janelle Perez is a nurse practitioner in Los Angeles, California. She could perform her duties in a nice hospital or private clinic. Instead, she spent years working among the homeless population on the Los Angeles streets. In 2011, she assembled a mobile medical team to provide medical care and housing for the homeless veterans in LA. She doesn't wear a nurse's uniform. She wears jeans and t-shirts and tennis shoes. She carries medical supplies and battered backpack. And many of these homeless veterans she's trying to reach suffer from men mental illness, addictions, or even post-traumatic stress disorder. She works hard to gain their trust. She brings along sandwiches. She sits and listens to their stories. And it may take months of visits and conversations before a veteran will let her take his blood pressure or even give him some medicine. She tells of encountering a homeless Air Force veteran suffering from schizophrenia who had lived on the streets for 20 years. She found him a safe place to live, but, she, but he still didn't trust her. He refused to use the electricity in his new apartment. He refused to let Janelle treat his schizophrenia with medication. So for weeks upon weeks upon weeks upon weeks to gain his trust, she sat on the floor of his apartment and listened to him tell stories of his life. Finally, she gained his trust. And this veteran's schizophrenia is now controlled by medications. He's living independently in his own apartment. He is reconnected with his family. He has a brand new life because one woman came to him where he was and never gave up on healing him. How many of us have ever given up on someone else because they didn't come to where we expected them to be right away. Yeah. Don't put your hands up, but I know some of you know what I'm talking about. 
that person's never going to get saved. That person's never going to do the right thing. That's not what the ministry of Mount Olive Church is about, though. Or at least it shouldn't be. We need to do whatever it takes, empowered by the Holy Spirit, through the love and ministry of Jesus Christ, to bring people to the healing grace of Jesus Christ. John writes, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The eternal Creator, God, put on our human flesh with its squishy, itchy, weak, and annoying imperfections and walked in our shoes. He experienced hunger and thirst, frustration and weakness, loneliness and overwhelming pain and loss. He did that for each of us. Did you hear that? He did that for each of us. He did it all so he could show us that we don't have to go searching for an unknowable God because he came looking for us. When we look at Jesus, not only do we see his plan for us, but we see God's love for us. It's love so amazing, so divine, it demands my soul, my life, my all. And finally, when we look at Jesus, we see God's gift to us. In Jesus, God poured out grace upon us. He flooded our world with his grace. And what is grace? The word means loving kindness or merciful kindness or unmerited favor. And John tells us in verse 14 that Jesus came to us full of grace and truth. Jesus came to show us the heart, the character, and the mind of God. And all those qualities were compressed into these two words found in John. Grace and truth. Now, in December of 1772, I don't think any of us go back that far. <laughs> Even though some of us are old geezers now. There was an Anglican priest preparing his sermon for the first Sunday of the new year. And his text for that message was 1 Chronicles 17, verses 16 and 17. I challenge you to circle that, those two verses in your Bible. First Chronicles 17, 16 and 17. And in this two verse passage, Nathan the prophet tells King David that God has promised that David's descendants would always serve as the kings of Israel. Now remember David's past. He was a humble shepherd boy when he was first chosen by God. He killed a Goliath with a slingshot. He killed some wild varmints when tending the sheep. But he also was an adulterer and sent a man off to war to die. He was a murderer. And in spite of all that, God was committed to working through his line. Talk about grace. I think of that and I think of all the terrible things that I've ever done. And I wonder how God keeps loving me. How he keeps forgiving me. How he keeps accepting me. I can't even imagine the awe and humility David felt when he heard God's promise. And in these verses, David responds to God and he says, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have brought me thus far? Now that Anglican priest reading the story of David that day back in 1772 was a man named John Newton. 
He could relate to King David. He had been a violent slave trader. But after he gave his life to Jesus Christ, it still took him many years to awaken to the evils of the trade of slavery. Once he fully confronted his sins, however, he left the slave trade and wrote an influential pamphlet exposing the suffering aboard the slave ships. And this pamphlet was distributed to every member of the British Parliament and helped influence the eventual outlawing of slavery in Great Britain. But John Newton could never forget the burden of sin that was lifted from his shoulders by his Savior, Jesus Christ. So how, so imagine how King David's words sounded to John Newton that day when he was preparing that message. Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my family? that you have brought me thus far. Amen. And with this repentance and gratitude fresh in his mind, he sat down and began writing the words to a hymn that he would teach his congregation on that first Sunday of the new year. The hymn goes like this. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I Sing it with me. Twas grace that taught my heart to feel, and grace my fears relieved. How precious So it's essential that we understand who God is and what God plans are for you. God has a plan for you. A plan to adopt you into his family and to love you. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. The eternal creator God wants a relationship with you. God loves you that much. And God has gifts of loving kindness and mercy and truth for all those who believe in and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's the simple gospel. And as the TV ad that was advertising telephones with technology, can you hear me now? 
Can you hear me now, people? God has sent you a message. God has sent you a message. God has sent you a message. And I hope you have received it. But the real test of effective communication will be whether you will act upon it. Now that you have received God's message, will you choose to commit your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Now God promised me as I began to prepare this message that there would be people here in the sanctuary of Mount Olive Church on the Sunday I preached that do not have the assurance that they are saved. That they have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ by faith and ask him to come into their heart and to forgive them of their sins. I don't know who those people are, but I know that they are there there are those of you who do know. And I just want to say, God has sent you a message that he has a plan for you, that he loves you, he wants to come to your heart, and he wants you and he to live together in oneness the rest of your days. Have you received that message? And will you act upon it? It's great to have a celebration and to burn a mortgage, but it's not about the mortgage, it's all about him. Amen. How holy and loving and wonderful he is that he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins so that we could have forgiveness of those sins and the hope of everlasting life. And that's what the ministry of Mount Olive Church and the purchase of that house and property is all about. Amen. Please don't ever lose sight of that fact and what God is going to do as we continue to let him lead us by his Holy Spirit's counsel. But let me say to those who don't have the assurance of salvation that you're not here today by chance. You're here by divine appointment. Amen. Amen. And he needs for you to receive that <laughs> message and to act on it. Because of his love. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Could I have David Lehman Jr., Shirley Cooster? Vince, Bill Doika, Jim Doika, Karen, Mark McDonley, Buzz, Cheryl, Marlon, and Pastor Tom to come up front here. And when all of you take out the insert that's in your bulletin, Come on up here. We can get, get you all up here. I've done this seven times before and we've never lost an officer. <laughs> Would all of you please turn to the insert as we declare our faith together? Would you please stand and unite with me in the Declaration of Faith. We burn this mortgage as a testimony to Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone, the pillar and ground of our faith. We burn this mortgage to honor God and his house of prayer, which shall be vibrant with efforts of men and women in search of truth, for all truth is God's. We burn this mortgage with gratitude for all whose faith and consecrated gifts 
have made the purchase and payment of Margaret Burnett's house and property possible. We burn this mortgage and dedicate all of our human effort to our loving God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Socks on? Okay. Now we're going to, this is not the real mortgage. It's in a safe place. Jesus. This is a copy. And I'm going to light it, and Tom is going to allow it to burn, but before we start a fire, he's going to take it outside. so that we don't burn the house down. Beauty of this, among other things. Pastor John asked me if I had a metal bucket or something that I could put this in. I've used this bucket to put creosote in garbage. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know if that creosote's gonna light I don't know. This is the message of God. God can take your junk, burn it up with his holy fire, clean you up, and make you whole. Forgive all the sins and everything else. And much like when we burn our manger, on New Year's Eve, there's nothing left but the ashes that once was. Amen. 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 I'm going to take this outside. Don't nobody touch this. <laughs> when all the church leaders turn to the bottom half of the left hand side of the paper where it says rededication of the house and property. And would you share in unison in that first paragraph? We present this house and property and our lives to be rededicated to the glory of God and to the service of ministry to all that will have the opportunity Amen. And here he comes. That's okay. Bottom of the left hand column where it says Pastor Tom Moore. In holy reverence and in the confidence that God our Father will accept that which is we do in his name. I now declare the house and the property of Mount Olive United Methodist Church to be rededicated to the glory of God. In his name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we bless this house and property, committing to God's love and care for all the ministries that occur with them. And everybody said, Glory be to be God on high. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. By wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. By knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Glory be to God on high. Pray with me. Almighty God, whose Son our Lord did by his presence bless his, the home in Bethlehem. We humbly request that you would bless this house and property, that your love may rest upon it, and that your promised presence may be manifest in them. May all the members of this household of faith grow in grace and in knowledge of you, and of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Teach us to love one another. Let me say that line again. Teach us to love one another as you have commanded us, 
and help us to choose the better part, which will not be taken away from us. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. Can we say, this has been a good day to be in church. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to say grace for, the, uh, for these guys. Thank Say. I'm going to say grace for the food downstairs. Everybody's welcome. Um, to fellowship. What a great day, huh? What a great, great day. Father, thank you for your abundant blessing, your abundant mercy. We ask a blessing upon the food, the fellowship downstairs. And in God's precious, holy Son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray it all. Amen. 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 So this is hymn number 585. You may be familiar with it. This is This Little Light of Mine. You can clap too. I can't clap and sing at the same time, but if you can't, go ahead. <laughs>